Welcome to the fourth installation of Quarantine Catch-Up. I am your host, Tommy Rinaldi. Returning today is Chris Famulero, and our special guest is one of my favorite people and good friend, Christian Gardner. How are you doing today, bud? I'm doing great. I've been a fan since episode one. Oh, thank you so much. Be on the show All time. four of them. <laughs> All four of them. <laughs> well, we appreciate you being a fan, and we appreciate you being here. Uh, so... How are you feeling amidst everything that's happening as of right now with quarantine and everything else going on? I mean, I always try to keep a positive attitude and just try to stay where you're at. But like at the same time, I'll be remiss to say that I'm not like tired, you know? Of and course. Just like not everything is going to be okay, you know? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, for the most part, I'm continuing to have that positive attitude and trying to make my way through it. And watching different shows and being with family and stuff like that, but still trying to, you know, keep my mind right and of course. continue to stay educated with what's going on. Well, that's really good to hear. I- I'm glad your family's doing well and that you're all hanging out together. Uh, what have you been watching? You said you were watching some stuff. Uh, what's on your playlist right now? Well, I currently started watching Ozark. I finished season one last night just to get in tune with that. I really like it. So far, I feel, I've heard a lot about it, mm-hmm. um, mostly um, from this music and film class that I took in the fall. Okay. Um, and so I, I've been paying attention, a little attention to that, in um, the subtleties of how they use music within that. But one of the things that stood out the most to me while watching that is the way that they use colors in that, like, the saturation yeah, of the way sure. it looks. Because, like, what what's going on is, like, it's really kind of grimy stuff as they're trying to money launder and get uh, working on crime mm-hmm. and stuff like that so they use kind of these blue colors and it's kind of hazy and everything kind of has an overcast to it mm-hmm. so it's making you kind of think that like hey this isn't exactly what you need to be and i think i picked up on it in episode eight it went back on a flashback okay to before he started to agree to be part of like this cartel and things like that mm-hmm. and everything is just completely clear with no overcast, no blue haze or anything. So it's pretty Yeah, I got to watch that show with my family, I believe at the beginning of quarantine. And I, I see exactly what you're saying. It's, it's like there's a constant storm over them because of the situation that they're in. Um, and you said you liked the first season. I personally, I was iffy about the first season. Um, I started to really like it in this past season, the third season. Um, but I think it's really well made. I think Jason Bateman, is a great star to have. He's also a good director to have. Uh, Laura Lenny, who plays the mom and the wife, I think she does a really good job. Uh, Fam, have you watched Ozark at all? I have not watched any of Ozark yet. It's definitely on my list. I have a good amount of things that is ever growing on that list, but Ozark is definitely up there on the top. I've heard a lot of good things from a lot of good people, so hopefully I'll check it out soon. Yeah, it's it's one of those shows. It's similar to Breaking Bad, but more into the Monday laundering portion of everything. So for me, it's it's season three of Breaking Bad, uh, just with different stakes uh, that each family has to deal with. Um, but again, really well made. Uh, Christian made some really good points. Christian, what else have you been watching? <laughs> um, well, I've been watching almost everything at this point because there's nothing else to do yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I spent a lot of like going back and watching old cartoons I used to watch as a kid so like Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends, Chowder um, <laughs> and of course y'all were talking about um, Avatar The Last Airbender that was oh, just more reappreciation for what I loved as a kid but like as like Fan was saying a couple episodes ago with Rob they like you appreciate more it's like you pick up on more subtleties and more hints to like different historical moments that we've seen throughout the course of history that you don't read eight years old. So <laughs> yeah, a lot uh, of that. I think Fam could speak more to his appreciation for Avatar. I know you're gonna probably watch that soon, right? Uh, probably I'll start it today. Honestly, I <laughs> I had finished the show that I was originally on, which is Letterkenny on Hulu, which is a hilarious show. Um. But honestly, after we're done here, I'm probably going to turn on Netflix and get back into that Avatar grind because, boy, do I need something to continue distracting me from everything else going on. So, <laughs> Avatar is it. It seems like Leonard Kenny was a good distraction. Do you want to tell us a little about that? Oh, I could talk about Letterkenny for hours. Letterkenny's <laughs> great. My, uh, 
I got to give my sister credit. Her and her roommates had been harping on me since like the fall to watch it. And finally my sister came down and stayed the weekend and was like, I'm going to make you watch Letterkenny and you're going to enjoy it. And I was like, all right, whatever. I have nothing else better to do. So we watched pretty much the whole first season. All the seasons are real, relatively short. They're about seven episodes each. And each episode is only about 23, 24 minutes. Uh, so you can go through them pretty quickly. But Letterkenny is basically just about a small town in Canada it's, that involves farmers, hockey players, and this group of people called Skids, which are, have you ever seen the videos of like goth or emo people that are dancing really like, mo like really emotively to electronic music? Of course. And that's what Skids are in <laughs> Letterkenny. And they're just these horrible group of people that like sell drugs. And like, it's just, you just get to watch all these things happen in this small town from the viewpoint of a bunch of different Canadian stereotypes and it's some of the funniest like character acting I've ever seen and just like going through the show you get to just grow with these characters as they do and running jokes continue from season to season and it's so well done and the one thing Christian I'm glad you brought it up but like music in this show is so incredible I've added so many songs from the show onto my like personal playlist just because it flows so perfectly from it and like I want to make a playlist and just share a playlist for that people who are interested can see it because it's it's such good music and I recommend anyone to watch Larry Kenny I'm glad my sister told me to because it is so so funny and it's so worth watching it's such a good distraction show from like it's so lighthearted and like stupid comedy but it's so good no I just watched a whole bunch of different like Canadian shows. Like I think Canada has a little bit of a come up kind of in TV because I was watching uh, Kim's Convenience. Mm -hmm. If you've ever seen that, that's on Netflix. Um, but it's just about this family in Toronto um, that runs like a convenience store. But it's just really funny. And like Shit's Creek is another Schitt's great Creek show is from so Canada. Funny. I heard Shit's Creek's great. Shit's Creek yeah. is so funny. And I've heard about Letterkenny. I think I've watched a couple Christian, episodes. Christian, you would love Letterkenny. It, <laughs> it, it has, like, the perfect amount of your humor. And, like, once you hear – they call themselves hicks, but the farmers, once you hear the way they talk, you can't not talk like them. And it's so <laughs> funny just, like, saying all their running jokes. And, like, my sister was down the previous weekend from this one with her boyfriend, and they were the ones that got me to watch it. So, like, the whole weekend was just us riffing jokes from the show to each other it's one of the most quotable shows ever like i've never been this excited i haven't been this excited about a show since i watched the office for the first time and tommy i remember you and i were the ones that really talked a lot after i i, I had watched the office for the first time and like that's how i feel about letter ken that's awesome like i've rewatched it a bunch the music is just so good christian i'll send you songs that i sent to tommy from the show great. it's so good it's just so funny i highly recommend it if you want a nice light-hearted show That'll just make you laugh from the dumbest things. It's it's a really really good watch. But Avatar is next up on my list. Good. Another show you just said that uh, Letter Kenny reminded you of a time of watching The Office, and a similar show that I just started watching is Community. And that show is something that I wish I found sooner because it's so funny and it's it could come out of anywhere. It could come from something in the background. It could uh, come from what the characters are saying it could come from the moment that they're in and i didn't realize what a gem this show really is and i'm so happy it's on netflix christian have you watched that oh you you are speaking to like my essence like i spent <laughs> middle school that show when i probably shouldn't have been watching that show because i was what like 11 12 but i mean <laughs> oh i love that show as a kid and then when i saw it on netflix i had to rewatch it and it just stands the test of time like it's just still so funny and to see that like the russo brothers who made all those mm -hmm. avengers movies that i love and also arrested development i was just like y'all just y'all just made everything i love i didn't yeah. i didn't know this <laughs> at all but yeah, I love it's it. really cool to see because even though they come from a comedy background with the rest of development and community, you see the tinges of that action directing and in, in the paintball uh, episodes that they have in community. Those are some of the best episodes in my opinion. And it, it's a nice blend of that humor that you also get from the MCU of, and that good high quality action, even though it's in a smaller space than something like a green screen for a Marvel movie, you know? 
And then you get characters like uh, Troy, played by Donald Glover. You get uh, Jeff, played by Joel McHale. I think the entire cast is actually at top notch throughout the entire show. I'm in season three. I heard it gets a little bit worse as seasons go on, but I'm enjoying every second of the show right now. Oh, it's it's so good, especially like during that time, that's when Donald Glover really starts to become Donald Glover, like Childish Gambino. Like he puts out that camp album in like 2012, which is right around like when that show is ramping up season three, where you're at right now. Mm-hmm. And I mean, uh, I just love Troy and Abed. Like I just love duo. that dynamic. Yeah, that's <laughs> so funny. And just whatever they do. I just absolutely adore that. And then <laughs> I can't, when I was rewatching it, I was like, did I, am I just Troy? Did, <laughs> did, I, did I do that to myself? And I was just looking back and I was like, huh, I guess I am. <laughs> <laughs> I guess watching it in middle school kind of influenced yeah. what you've become. And I think that's not a bad thing in any way. He's a good friend. He's hilarious. Uh, very good musically. He, he's a little bit of everything within that show, and he's great. Um, I think that's another show with really good songs within it. It's not necessarily the score, but more the soundtrack of the, the music that they play for each other, uh, the music that they play in the background to uh, enhance a scene. Um, music has been coming out here and there throughout quarantine, and recently we got Run the Jewels 4. Have either of you listened to it? I listened to it as soon as I saw that they released it early for free. I love it. I I'm a huge fan of Run the Jewels. I've been I've been trying I've been on that since RTJ two, mm-hmm. and I went back and previously listened to the original Run the Jewels. Run the Run the Jewels three is probably my favorite out of all of them, but Run the Jewels four is so good. And there's one song in particular on Run the Jewels four that just blows you away it's so it's so well done and the two guest appearances that they have um for zach from um rage Rage against the machine Machine Mm -hmm. and pharrell williams for uh a vocal performance it's it's like it's run the jewels encompassed with with like these iconic voices from from two different genres and it's Mm -hmm. perfectly put together on this one song that is so perfect for what is going on in the world. Christian, have you gotten to listen to any of it? I haven't so much. I, I haven't been a huge Run the Jewels fan, but like of what I've heard, I've always liked, I got into them when I heard them on like the Black Panther trailer and when that came out and got into that a little bit, but I've always liked Killer Mike and what they always have to say, like they always have like a deeper thing to say whenever they step to the mic or just not even rapping or just being an, an activist. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Killer Mike has a voice, not just within rap, but within the community. And I think that's really important to have. Uh, I know you're a big fan of his show, Trigger Warning, I believe was the name of that show. Yeah. Uh, do you want to speak on to that show? Because I think that show is also, it's a bright light because it's funny, but it's also educational. Uh, I love Trigger Warning. I was uh, put that on by Ben Harris. Um, but I had to shout him out real quick. Of course. Just in, just in case you're watching. Um, but trigger warning, just kind of pushing the needle and trying to uh, change the narrative of different things. I think the one the one episode that stands out the most to me was trying to rebrand um, gangs and stuff like that. <laughs> but it was like Cripacola and um, uh, what was it? Blood soda, whatever it was. But just like trying to make people see things differently. Yeah, yeah, different light and different things like that. But it's still, as you said, really funny at the same time. I think everyone should watch it. It's a great recommendation. Uh, I- I've watched a couple episodes. And like I said earlier, it's funny. It's educational. It does make you see things in a different light, like, like you were saying. Um, I enjoyed Run the Jewels 4. Uh, I've listened to a handful. I haven't listened to it top to bottom yet. But like you were saying, the song with Dac- uh, Zach De La Roca and Pharrell is really, really good. Uh, Ooh La La, I believe, is the main single off of that album, and it's really great. Um, and there's, they're just a dynamic duo. Uh, they know each other's flow. They know uh, LP's a great producer, and I think he makes music for both of them to really grasp onto and deliver their message. And I was really excited to, for it to come out and to hear it. Um, moving forward, 
you just finished up a wacky semester at Seton Hall uh, with everything going on. What was that like to be at school and then all of a sudden have to go back to Virginia and uh, deal with this quarantine and schooling and everything like that? I, it was it was just really a really strange time. I mean, everyone went through a strange time, even mm -hmm. if you're in school or not. But just the thought that um, we were supposed to come back just after a month of quarantine just kind of showed how little we knew about COVID-19, just to have that suspicion that, oh, after a month of being at home, we can just, we'll be back at school fine. Um, but then, of course, it didn't play out that way. And then people's stuff were still up there, my own stuff, and they said to come back and get it. And when I, when I was about to go back and get my stuff, that's when Virginia put in the stay at home order. So then I couldn't go back and get my stuff. <laughs> And so they had to end up mailing me my stuff. And I, I got that either last week or two weeks ago. That's crazy. But I mean, going through school, I didn't have any production classes, mm -hmm. but people who were in TV two that still had to try and put out a show while online, that just seemed insane to me. And then obviously at the same time, when I was taking a whole bunch of classes that I didn't necessarily feel pertain to my like career path, it, it's hard to motivate yourself For to sure. continue to like, do that work and stuff. But it, I mean, we got it done, got it through. And so, yeah, but there, there are times that I was just like, I, I don't, <laughs> I, I, I just don't want to do this anymore. But obviously you got to do what you got to do to make it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I, I know, uh, you've been taking up a bigger role within Pirate TV, which is something that we were all very lucky to do and meet each other at. Um, my last semester there was a fall semester and, and I really saw you coming into your own and stepping up. What are some things that you would want to do within Pirate TV going forward? I know that next semester is gonna be a weird one with no breaks in between. So you kind of have a lot of time to focus in on it. Uh, what are your plans? What would you like to do with the crew that we have there? Oh, hopefully to get out of the studio more and do more field reporting, getting out into the field and talking to people and different things like that. See, like trying to be a voice throughout all of campus, you know, mm -hmm. and um, trying to be able to have a little bit more than just pirate news and continue the path that Rob was doing and having still our specialty shows and having more to do within that as well. So just trying to continue down that path as long with trying to, build a greater voice within the campus. And one of the ideas that I threw around talking to Veronica, who's gonna be our social media manager moving forward, um, was having like a pirate takeover on our Seton Hall Pirate TV stories, our Instagram stories. Fun. So it's just kind of like a day in the life type of thing. Um, and hopefully we could get it in a partnership with some of the women's basketball players, uh, cause we've been talking to um, Mr. Sweeney throughout the entire, year and we had a pretty good connection with him so hopefully we can do something like that and then it doesn't even have to be with just athletes or something like that hopefully we could get the SGA president Julia Nichols to do something like that so definitely trying to gain just a bigger voice within our Seton Hall community and you know continue to move towards things that we already established and continue the legacy that Rob and you guys have already built on. Well, Christian, uh, going, going forward, so now something, especially with all the events going on and with COVID and with protests, how do you think that being a student who's learning production and communications, how do you think the situation based on what you've been seeing in televised news or print media versus what you've been seeing on social media, how do you think that is affecting people as a whole when it comes to taking in truthful information and not just you know like a focused viewpoint from say either the news or from the newspaper or from online presence i think something that i've, I've learned is that no matter what channel that you're watching there is going to be some inherent type of bias so everyone no matter who it is has to do their own research and so that has to be with social media you have to use social media to see what's going on because a lot of the things that we see on Twitter 
will not be shown on television as well. Because we've seen so many protests being escalated by the police and we haven't seen so much as that on TV. Even the Buffalo video, I don't know if you've seen that so far, um, that 75 year old man was just walking towards the police and then was pushed and fell to the ground and his head started bleeding. I don't think I've seen anything on that on TV so far. So we have to do our job as part of the media to still balance and show all the scopes of everything that's going on. That's something that I try to do uh, when I went to one protest in DC, I put that on the Seton Hall BTV Instagram. So obviously it's not the same scale as media outlets, but we still have our own platforms. So we have to continue to push out things that are happening and going on in our world today. Do you think this is a good experience for broadcasting students or journalism students when it comes to how people can evolve and innovate when it comes to what it seems like people are struggling to get out the information that I think a lot of the public should be? Or do you think that this is kind of a trying time and not a lot of people have answers? I think what we learned, especially during the pandemic, uh, we still had to continue to put out um, our documentary for Field 2, which was about um, uh, this church, First Baptist Church of South Orange. So it's just teaching people that no matter what, the show has to go on. So we ha our job is to continue to put out um, credible media things of different videos and keeping up with what's going on, because that's our job as news and as media outlet. So I think it's definitely a learning time for anyone that's trying to break into broadcast. I think the real thing is to keep your mind open and, and like you're saying, take in that knowledge and learn from anyone you can. Um, keep an open dialogue with whoever you're talking to about any of the situations going on and not just staying hard-minded and opinionated like a lot of these news outlets really are that we see on TV. Um, what was the protest like when you were there? I know uh, you went out, you're in the D.C. area. Um, what was your experience with that? It was just a very peaceful time. And the thing that struck me the most is that um, we saw this um, promo for it that was going to happen on Sunday. We're going to walk from Howard University, which is an HBCU in D.C., down to the White House. And when we got there, it was only maybe like 20 people at first, and then it grew to 40 people. Then it was 100 people. And then we started walking, and it was easily like a thousand plus people that were with us and the people that planned it were people that are our age and the first person to talk was a 17 year old girl and I was just absolutely in awe of that it just kind of shows what was going on it was completely peaceful the entire time and we were actually escorted by the police down to the White House and it was just a very 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 good time and we would say chance walking in the street and we would take meals and have moment of silences and it was just a very interesting time and then made it all the way down to the white house where usually you can go almost right up to the fence but you couldn't even go into like the park that leads up to the white house and you can only barely see it and now they have that eight foot wall fence that was there and um for the people that like saw the tear gas that was shot for the president to take his picture in front of the St. John's church. I was, I was right there the, just days before that, just days before that I was literally standing right there. So, I mean, it just kind of puts things into perspective and they just keep on pushing people back from that point, even though they're just trying to voice an opinion. Yeah. I think right now is a big time for a lot of, activism in any sort of way you can do it, whether or not it's from going to a protest or voicing your opinions online or donating or signing petitions or even just informing other people who don't have that viewpoint. And this is kind of the point I was getting at earlier was the fact of, you know, all three of us have the three major social media platforms, which are Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And just going in between from these past 10 days, you could see the visible difference on the type of information that's being spread on all three and Twitter. I feel like 
you're seeing a lot of what people our age are trying to do and the actions that are being taken against them by the police as well as you know people in the older generations and then if you go on the same day to Facebook you wouldn't see you would you would see all the good things of police standing with protesters or walking with protesters but you could go in the same five minutes and go to Twitter and you can see a thread of over 200 different instances of police brutality against protesters so it's just I think that's kind of the learning lesson here is even in the social medias that are accessible to everyone there's an initial bias between not even you know political beliefs or or skin color or sexual orientation it's just generational beliefs that are being biased against one another and I think that's the biggest problem right now for the Black Lives Matter movement is that there's a whole generation of people who are only seeing one side of a story that is really then hurting another side. I think we're in a moment of history and, and thankfully uh, Christian took steps to be within that history and going out and march and everything like that, uh, speaking out, donating, a bunch of those things. And I think it's really important to have that platform we have this platform here and we're able to uh, speak to it. Um, what have you been doing? I, I know going through things like Twitter, you, you're getting to see a bunch of things that you wouldn't normally see day to day. And it's important to see, but it's also, it weighs on you at a certain extent. What have you been doing to keep yourself positive and lighthearted during this time? <laughs> it's kind of hard <laughs> sometimes. I mean, just going through Twitter so much, like it just, especially at when it was at the thick of it in this mm -hmm. past week, it was just everything on Twitter is just making you more and more mad. So definitely just trying to take away times, take away from Twitter and watching Netflix and different things like that. And just trying to put your mind on something else. But at the same time, I always kind of told myself that we have to continue to to face what's going on mm -hmm. and just because that it's a struggle for me right right now to continue to swipe through twitter i have to continue to do that to stay educated if i'm going to ask other people to do the same thing so obviously you still have to take time to continue your own mental health and do whatever that is if it's like going out on a walk or different things like that or netflix playing playing video games or something like that I've actually started um, reading some comic books. Uh, awesome. Yeah, I won a bobblehead from the Washington Wizards, and it was a Bradley Beal Black Panther bobblehead. That's awesome. And it came with a promo code to get a free Black Panther issue. I was like, well, shoo, I've always liked comic books. <laughs> and so I got into that more. I, I read this Miles Morales thing and um, this one storyline, Absolute Carnage, with his um, all about how um, the symbiotes are trying to reclaim the earth and take it for themselves and get back to their, their god null and things like that. So they're trying to um, kill any superhero that had taken a symbiote. So that includes, obviously, Spider-Man, um, Eddie Brock, Captain America, Wolverine. And so it was a pretty interesting storyline, pretty fun. So I've been doing that for the last couple of days. That's a really nice thing that you get from the escapism of comics. And that's why a lot of people go to it and indulge in the books, the movies and everything like that. Fam, what have you been doing? Uh, well, on the same vein of superheroes, I've been playing, uh, as you can tell, I'm a pretty big video game person from all the other podcasts. I can't not talk about them. So uh, in the same vein of superheroes, I'm continuing my journey through the Arkham games, the Batman Arkham games. I beat Arkham City, and I'm now more than halfway through Arkham Knight, um, which is my first playthrough of it. I think it's a great game. It's an improvement from Arkham City. Um, there's a lot of Batmobile driving in it, almost too much, one could say. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's fun. You know, it's, it's a really good, like, just good combat game. But it's also been weird playing it during what's going on right now. So I've been alternating that with playing... Um, or Stardew Valley, because who doesn't like farming? Um, <laughs> and uh, other than that, I started playing through the Halo series again with my with my friend. So me and my friend uh, Nick Mullen, we beat 
both uh, the remasters of Halo Combat Evolved and Halo 2. And we are about to start Halo 3 with our two other friends. And then we're going to continue on from ODSG to Reach and then Halo 4. So, And then after that, we're going to find another game to play because who knows <laughs> when all this is going to be over. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Christian, I, I know you play Madden and some other stuff. What, what have you been playing during this quarantine? Well, I restarted playing 2K17 because that was the last good my career, in my opinion. But when I started the my career, Kobe Bryant opens it up. Yikes. And it's like, I hope you have as good a career as me. I was just like. It's different. Got to shut it off. It's absolutely different. Yeah. It's absolutely different because, oh, that that just, it took me out. But, I mean, it's it's still fun. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, (laughs) It's the one with Michael B. Jordan in it. Yes. and juice. Michael B. Jordan actually goes to Seton Hall in that game. So that's pretty fun. So, I'd love hey, to see go it. Pirates. Super go Pirates. 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 Wow. Um, yeah, go ahead. Oh, uh, well, I was just going to argue your point of 2K19 was pretty good. My player was pretty fun in that one. But then wow. again, I hadn't owned a 2K prior. So what? who am I to say? <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't get 2K19. I didn't bring any of my, like, consoles to school or anything so there's no reason for me to get 2k19 a lot of the ways that we got to bond together as a ptv family what was going into the studio and playing video games together um we got to play smash and all those other great games um what's a moment that you wish you could relive within the ptv studio uh if one of you have one first you could go you want me to go first christian Yes, I had to think. <laughs> All right. I would I would probably just want to relive one of those days, like one of those really long days we had in the studio where we would do a shooting first. Either it was we would do hall talk or we would even do a PTV and then all of us would just kind of stay and hang out or we'd go get dinner together and then we would go back to the studio. And I mean, everything was everything was great then. We had almost nothing to worry about besides our homework or our work to do but like we had done our ptv stuff so then we were just there hanging out with each other and like you said we would you know borrow one of our friend ryan's nintendo switch and we would just play smash or we would play mario kart or super mario tennis and it was just really wholesome because everybody was together and we were all listening to music and people were eating and just enjoying each other's time you know it wasn't so heavy (laughs) <laughs> yeah i would say any of those times that we pulled out the couch <laughs> down to the floor um any any of like the parties that we had just like talking to people like that one time that we all sat in a circle i think it was like the end of the year party like that was, that was just a really interesting time i don't think anyone else could have that kind of unique moment of having like 10 to 15 people just sit in a circle and just say like the deepest things like from their own past and doing things like that. So I think that was just an interesting time. And obviously Monopoly nights, those were fun, even though I hate Monopoly. I think it's a, I think it's I a garbage Monopoly. game. I, I, I don't, no, no, <laughs> just no. But it's just a good time to just be around. Yeah, I, I was actually going to take the one of the night we all sat around with about 10 to 15 people, like you were saying. And, Jeez, be original, Tommy. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I was going to say that, but I'll go to the times before Hall Talk where we're listening to music and dancing and getting everything together. Um, even though Hall Talk was so much stressful before trying to hook up the TV, making sure your lighting was all good and everything like that, we still made the most of it hung out with each other, still had some of those deeper moments, had a lot of laughs um, and just a lot of stupid dancing and singing in the midst of it. And I thought that was a lot of fun between all of us, uh, singing a lot of high school musical and camp rock and some other stuff. But I mean, I think we're the only ones that actually fight for camp rock. Like, and I that's think okay. That's- <laughs> <laughs> We've put on a many performances of many a performance. This Is Me. So Listen, this is, that's all we need for it, you know? <laughs> yeah, uh, your guys' appreciation of those Disney movies, I just can't get behind. I, I, I was forced to sit there and listen to you guys just jam out High School Musical 3 for like the 70th time. I, Christian I was the only one to do High School Musical 3. <laughs> 
Okay, listen, it's <laughs> not my fault that I understand cinema, okay? <laughs> Scream is a cinematic performance. And Christopher Nolan took the rotating locker scene and put it into Inception. And, bro, you can't... Mm, mm. He I said, Kenny Ortega so in... is over here, Christopher Nolan. Christopher Nolan, right? Actually, are y'all going to see Tenet in theaters? When I it would comes like out? to. Whenever I'm allowed to go back. Whenever I'm allowed to go back. I definitely want to. I know some things are going uh, video on demand uh, coming out. Uh, King of Staten Island is going to come out in June 12th, and I'm very excited for that. I actually low-key want to see that movie. I'm very excited for that. Um, I know me and my girlfriend Sam are going to watch it uh, together, text through it, and then talk about it after. And I I can't wait. I think Pete Davidson's a really interesting character that uh, gets some unneeded press sometimes because of who he's dating and the, the, the lores around that but uh watching some of his interviews I, I think he's a good guy deep down and seeing his relationship with people like john mulaney and uh other comedians like that i think it, i think he's a good guy and i think this is going to be a good movie i think so too and, I, and he also like played a part in writing this along with judd apatow and mm-hmm. judd apatow has so many good movies so i'm i'm really excited to see how this one turns out but I, I, what what for y'all has been like a movie that came out on demand that maybe you weren't gonna watch it before, or at least it just struck you so much now that it did come out and you had the ability to see it. Oh, man. Does that I mean, include streaming? Yes, include streaming. Okay. The only one I can think of was Onward that came out on Disney mm-hmm. Plus. Like, I wasn't super psyched about going to see it. I can't tell you the last time I was that excited to go see a, a Pixar movie. Uh, maybe Incredibles 2 was probably the last one. But um, I wasn't that excited to go see it. And then I, I came out on Disney Plus and I watched it with my girlfriend at the time. And then, uh, you know, we both liked it. And it was a good, it was a good movie. And I'm glad that I watched it. It would have been, I probably wouldn't have seen it if it came out in theaters, but it came out on, on demand and it was something to do. So we did it and I enjoyed it. With Tenet trying to come out in theaters, uh, depending on what happens with COVID and everything and social distancing, what do you think is going to happen with movie theaters and maybe the future of streaming as well? I thought you was going to talk. All right, I'll talk. <laughs> um, I would say that a lot of this, people have been able to lean on streaming and maybe people will go towards that. I mean, we saw The Five Bloods is supposed to come out um, this week, and that was straight to Netflix. And I think maybe more big directors like Spike Lee will maybe just move towards streaming and see how well that, that goes for him being on Netflix. Um, but I, I think personally, it just might cave into just everything being streaming. But I, I enjoy the theater experience. I think movies like, big superhero movies like Endgame, like, it wouldn't be as much be watching that just by myself, you know? So I think there's a lot to benefit from the in theater experience. So hopefully can continue to push that, move that forward. Well, I think the main thing is like a lot of, a lot of movies are made for, to be viewed in movie theaters. You know, it's like, they're not made to be seen on 60 inch screens or 42 inch screens, or even, you know, laptop screens that are like 20 some odd inches, you know, it's, they're meant to be seen on a large screen and heard in surround sound. And so that the viewer can take in everything that's going on. So while I do think streaming services are great and it's been interesting to see big directors like Spike Lee or the Russo brothers or, uh, you know, any of any other director who transitions to streaming services like Netflix or Hulu, I think it also might encourage people, Tommy, like you were saying to go instead do the video on demand kind of way of it so that you can still maybe get your different aspect ratios or even your potential changing of frame rates since now there's that other technology out like 4k streaming and stuff like that it might kind of encourage people to not go to streaming services that can limit your streaming capabilities when it comes to your frame rate or from your actual clarity uh, of the video so I hope that the movie theaters are able to come back, but I don't, I don't know how, you know, well the experience will be, you know, you have to take into consideration, take into consideration social distancing, amount of people in the theater, 
just even how clean movie theaters are, you know, it's <laughs> a lot of things in all aspects of the world come into question, but definitely movie theaters are one that people should be interested in seeing how they move forward from here. With the conventional movie theater kind of dying out, like we're saying, do you think that drive-in movie theaters will come back into popularity and this way you're still getting that community experience, but you're not necessarily as close to each other and if you don't like a movie, go when you want, all these different other factors. Do you think drive-in movie theaters are viable? Have you guys gone to a drive-in movie theater? I never have. Okay, so I would I'm like the to. Only one, I'm the only one here that's been to a drive-in movie theater. Uh, from my experience, I've been to the drive-in movie theater in Vineland, New Jersey, which is the only one in New Jersey. Um, it's like an hour and a half away from where I live, and that's 40-some-odd minutes away from you, Tommy. So. Mm. Uh, they're not super community viewing experiences, you know, it's very isolated to who you're in the car with, you know, you're not really, it's kind of like when you go to a professional sporting event and people are tailgating, I don't know how many people, I don't know how many times you communicate with the other tailgaters, Yeah. you know, it's kind of, it's kind of an isolated experience for this whole entire group of people, everyone is isolated to their specific parking spot so the same thing kind of happens in movie theaters you know people either pop up pop up in the back of their car or they sit in their truck their truck bed or you know you're they're just sitting in the front seats of their car within that scenario it's not very a super social organization that kind of happens you know i think the most social you get is when you're online at the concession stand and even at that point if you're going to a movie theater uh instead or you're going to a drive-in movie theater instead of a regular sit-in movie theater I don't know if you'd even go to the concession stand at that point. You could just bring your own food. Nobody's going to check. So That's true. Diamond movie theaters are cool, but they're not a very social experience. But therefore, neither are regular movie theaters. I've never gone to a movie theater and been looked at the person next to me and go, hey, man, what's going on? You excited to see this movie? It's, <laughs> it's very much it's very much a anti-social experience. Mm-hmm. Christian, would you want to do drive-in movie theaters? Uh, you haven't experienced one, but would you like to? Uh, it has been thrown around, so I feel like there has it will grow during this time. Mm-hmm. But I think going back to a movie theater in COVID nineteen will also kind of be the feeling of feeling the need to support a movie theater, needing to support a movie, just like the same way that people won't pirate movies. Mm-hmm. I think it's going to be something like that. So it's like trying to go out of your way because people will feel that, you know, I can get this movie at home. Eventually it will end up somewhere on streaming. I can, I don't have to go out of my way to go to a drive-in or to go to any type of movie theater. It's going to feel the same way as feeling the need to purchase the movie rather than like pirate it. I I totally see what you're saying. And you you mentioned Tenet earlier and Christopher Nolan is one of those directors that likes to have his movies in theaters, IMAX, you have all that sound, that giant uh, screen and everything. Um, what are some of your cr- favorite Christopher Nolan movies? I know he's been an influence on all of us and his movies are some of the best that have come out in recent memory. Uh, what movies do you like from him? What do you like about him? And uh, yeah. I just have to say, he don't miss. <laughs> he, he don't miss. I think, um, but one of my favorite by far is Inception. It's just, that movie came out in 2011. It was one of the movies that we had in the back of the car. And I would just watch that constantly. Mm-hmm. Just, it was the first one that like, of course I've seen Dark Knight and different things like that. But it was the one that like changed for me in the concept of, realities and changing everything like that and I feel like I took more away from it every time I watched it little different hints and different things like that and of course I think better movies have come out like Interstellar but for me Inception is my by far my favorite movie of all time that's awesome fam yeah I mean Interstellar is probably my favorite one of my favorite movies of all time uh and I was our like I was a huge fan of Christopher Nolan to begin with but that movie is like an epic for me it's my favorite movie i have it on blu-ray i've watched it probably over 30 times at this point which is crazy for nearly a three-hour movie but i i love that film and i think it's incredible but a a close second which i've appreciated it more the more i've watched it since it came out was dunkirk Mm -hmm. and 
being a big war movie person, my first viewing of Dunkirk was not, I was kind of underwhelmed by it, mainly by the sense because I think I had a different interpretation from the trailers that had come out. But the more I watch it, the more I admire that film for what it is, because it's kind of a, it's kind of a movie with no main character. Like it has a central focus and it has a, it has a protagonist that you follow along, but he doesn't ever really talk. And all of the actions that drive the movie are done through other people. You're kind of just, you're kind of like just backseating with the protagonist kind of viewing everything that's going along. But the thing that always brings me back to that movie is the sound and the, the technique of nonlinear storytelling that, that Christopher Nolan has continued to um, explore as he's come out with more movies and just the way that that story is told and the way that his cinematography and the sound specifically, that movie I'm so glad I saw in theaters because the rumbling I felt in the movie theater from the gunshots and the planes and, and just how mechanical the movie sounds. It's so well done and it's such a, an incredible viewing experience that I feel bad for anyone who has seen that movie and didn't see it either in the theater or a, even in a surround sound system type setting where you could really feel what Christopher Nolan was going for because that movie is so well done when it comes to, um, you know, really getting you to feel the tenseness of war and how scary it can be when it comes to just the sounds. You don't have to see what's coming, but if you could hear it and you know the impending doom that's on the other side of a street, that's scary enough to then, rather than seeing you know, the, than seeing the, the trouble coming towards you. Another scene that I can reference in, in um, similarity to Dunkirk is in Saving Private Ryan, which is my all-time favorite movie. But it's in the end of the, the final act of the movie where they're defending the, the town on the river to defend the bridges, and you hear the tanks and the marching before you see them. Mm -hmm. And all you hear is the rumbling, and you hear the chains rattling, and you hear the treads moving, and you hear the marching of of all the, the hundreds of soldiers coming into their town. That's what makes that situation scary. You know, it's, it's filmmakers using all of their ability to envelop the viewer in this feeling of dread. You know, you don't have to see a tank rolling at you to know it's coming. The fact that you can hear it before you would ever see it is what's scary. So I went off on a tangent there, but Dunkirk is up there increasingly for Christopher Nolan films, but it's always interstellar up at the top. He, he's made, all his movies are good. And the only one I haven't seen is his first film. I believe it's called either The Following or Following. And everything else has blown my mind as it's come out. The only one I've seen in theater was Dunkirk. And like you were saying, if I haven't watched it in theater, I, I don't know if I would like it as much. I, I have it on DVD in my house. I still like it, but, um, like you're saying, the feeling that you get of the dread, and it has some of the most beautiful shots I've ever seen. Those dogfight scenes are really good. That one scene where the bombs are blowing up towards camera and he's just coming down, that's a, another amazing shot. Uh, Christian, I wish I saw Inception in theaters because I feel like that's when that whole mind-bending type of thriller really became at the forefront of the box office and everything like that getting to see that for the first time with a crowd i think um really would have been an amazing experience and that movie thankfully is an amazing experience no matter where you watch it interstellar i saw later on and i like it but not as much as a lot of other people do i, I hold inception above it my two favorites it's a toss-up it's either the dark knight or the prestige uh, i'm a very big batman fan and um, I think it's one of the most well-made superhero movies of all time and one of the most well-made movies of all time. It's number four on IMDb. Uh, it has this huge following and I think it's great. And The Prestige, I think it has a young Hugh Jackman relative to his career uh, doing an amazing performance and someone in Christian Bale that doesn't miss. Uh, I, I think Christian Bale's career has been up their echelon his entire career. And that goes along with Christopher Nolan, like you were saying, Christian, he, he hasn't missed with a movie uh, from something like Insomnia that doesn't really have that much of a following, but is still a really well-told story to something like Inception or Interstellar. Uh, 
I'm excited to see what he has coming in the future with Tenet and whatever movies he has going forward. Um, what are some other directors that you've come to love through the movies you watched? Well, I've always, I came into, I'll say Ryan Coogler for now. Um, but I first saw Fruitvale Station, which came out in 2013. And that was just, that was an amazing movie to me. And just, especially for this time right now, I think I need to go back and watch that. And I implore everyone else to go back and watch that. But also what he did with Black Panther was amazing. Um, but obviously, and I'm also a pretty big Wes Anderson fan. After I saw um, the Grand Budapest Hotel last summer, I just absolutely loved that movie and just kind of the wittiness of it and just, and the different, shots i i really like how he had everything centered i know that's like his big shtick or whatever yeah the, the symmetry <laughs> yeah the symmetry and i i just i i like that i think it's just more pleasing to the eye personally those are really good choices uh when i first saw fruitvale station it, it's one of the only movies that have made me cry I, like it's crazy because it's it's a true story and it, it's something that really hits home especially in times like now and Wes Anderson, I'm right on that boat with you of, I love Fantastic Mr. Fox. I love Moonrise Kingdom. I love Grand Budapest Hotel. He's very stylized, but it's not style over substance. He still has a really good story going through all of his movies. Uh, fam, who are some directors that you really revere? Uh, I'm a big fan of the Coen brothers. Um, I, you know, within the last year since graduating college, I've tried to find a lot more of their movies. Um, I watched In Bruges for the first time um, a couple months ago at this point, a while ago at this point, and I just, I loved it. I love their style, and they have very, they have very dark humor. I mean, you can see it from Fargo and the, the, um, the other movie with George Clooney and Brad Pitt, and wow, I can't remember the name of it, but I also watched that one, but In Bruges was so interesting to me because I, I really like Colin Farrell as an actor. I think mm -hmm. he's hilarious. I think he has this incredible sense of humor uh and his delivery is really unparalleled when it comes to like the coen brothers style of comedy where it's like almost like him saying it him being so shocked but also such a dirtbag is what's so <laughs> funny about it yeah and in bruges is so great because he's a very traumatized he's a traumatized hitman about like what's going on and in Bruges is just these two hitmen laying low and, and their whole situation devolving. And it's a really dark movie, but the comedy in it is just so well done. And it's so like, it'll just hit right on the head every time. And it's such wacky humor. And I think Colin Farrell is perfect for it. And I'm a big fan of the Coen brothers. I really like Fargo. Uh, other than I think that, you were talking about Burn After Reading, the one with- Burn Coach After Clint. Reading, yeah. yes. That movie is also hilarious, and George Clooney it carries that movie, <laughs> and it's so well done. And I, it's I love the I love the Coen Brothers. I think they're great. Um, Coen Brothers also did Big Lebowski, right? I believe so, and that's very. Fi I think it fits their tone, especially. I, I'm pretty their sure movies I'm not, I'm pretty have sure that. I'm not mistaken on that. Yeah. But Big Lebowski is another film that really fits well in to that area and i think that movie's hilarious too i stumbled upon that movie when i was like in middle school watching mm -hmm. it on like hbo and i couldn't find it for years until i was in college and then i watched it again through and it's so damn funny it's just so well done jeff bridges is hilarious in that film <laughs> yes he is uh like you're saying I, I didn't really get to watch their movies until i got older so um watching things like fargo and, and no country for old men they have a lot of really strong movies that, like you're saying, they have that odd sense of humor where it's very much their own dialogue because their scripts, if you don't go by their scripts, like there's no ad libs or anything like that. It's very by the book. And that's, I think that's what makes their movies so good. They know exactly what they want, kind of like a Quentin Tarantino. You, you know their sense of humor. You know what you're going to get out of them. Um, that's a really good pick. For me, it would be Edgar Wright. Uh, I remember watching Shaun of the Dead when I was younger and I was like, this is a really like funny, stupid movie. But then as I got older, I watched it again. And I was like, oh, this is hilarious on every level between the transitions and how he edits to the music and all this other stuff. And 
watching Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, um, the rest of the Cornetto trilogy with uh, uh, At World's End and Hot Fuzz. And then I got to see Baby Driver in theaters and I was like, this is, in my opinion, his best movie. And it was a culmination of something he wants to, he wanted to do for years upon years of setting a whole movie to a soundtrack and everything being cut to the beat. And between him and Christopher Nolan, it's the attention to detail is unlike any other, in my opinion, they're willing to put in that work to get that extra little thing that you need in there for something like, uh, Scott uh, Pilgrim vs. the World, you get the transitions and uh, the little text bubbles and everything like that to make it look like a comic book movie. I think it's really good. I, I, I love Edgar Wright. Yeah, Quentin, movies. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Christian. Uh, I'm Quentin Tarantino is probably also up there for me, but um, I'm I'm more of a fan of his more recent films than some of his older stuff. Like I really appreciate um, Pulp Fiction. And Reservoir Dogs, but you know, Django Unchained is really like I admire that film a lot for how I, Tommy, we've talked about this prior, but like just how emotional that movie can be mm-hmm. and how scary it can be just through his directing alone and his use of music and his soundtrack and his scoring. I think he's only gotten better with it, and then we got to see that culmination in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood with the your the use of music and the setting and as well as the acting i mean he always chooses great leads in his in his movies but between Django and chain once upon a time in hollywood and inglorious bastards quentin tarantino is <clears throat> is definitely up there for me when it comes to directors but christian i want also want to hear what you got to say i was gonna say for comedy stuff i just wanted to shout out to kai watiti i think what he's been doing for the last yeah. couple of years just so good and especially um with jojo jojo this past jojo year rabbit, yeah jojo rabbit was so so good and i've always i love thor ragnarok and knowing that he was part of the mandalorian mm-hmm. like it, it just makes sense it just makes sense and what he's gonna do with these new star wars movies that are gonna come out written by him i'm just really excited have you seen what we do in the shadows it's so good i have not but you should you should watch what we do in the shadows if you like taiko watiti because that is like the culmination of taiko watiti's sense of humor it's 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 very funny it's It's very funny and and chris to your point with tarantino i actually personally like his older stuff more reservoir dogs is my favorite movie of his um but I, i i totally get what you're saying that i think he's come into his own he's mastered his craft with each movie as they come out. And um, we had a nice conversation about once upon a time in Hollywood and it's a true fairy tale and it's set in a time that I think he wishes he was part of because he's a film historian himself. He collects movies and all this stuff. And I think this is his ode to Hollywood and what could have been um, at that time. Uh, I believe this is going to do it for the end of our episode. Christian, I want to thank you so much for coming on and talking to us about everything. It was really nice to catch up with you, fam. As always, a pleasure. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe to this video, and we'll have more for you. Thank you.